What if the biggest killer of the last 100 years was the lie that cholesterol and meat are bad for us? If you are one of those vegans that is trying to raise your cat, a carnivore on a vegan diet, or your baby, I have some news for you. You actually do need animal foods to have your baby develop proper intelligence as an adult. There's a low meat eating disease that was discovered back in the day. It's called pellagra, and it causes brain atrophy and subsequent low IQ, dementia, poor social behavior, and a completely messed up gut. Our biology doesn't just suggest meat is an option. It shows that animal foods were essential for the development of the human species as we know it today. But here's the big question. If we're biologically wired for meat, what does that mean for how we should eat today? Are modern health trends ignoring our evolutionary heritage? Have you noticed how meat seems to have become public enemy number one lately? Why is there such an aggressive push to demonize it? And where did this controversy even begin? These questions have been keeping me up at night. So I did what I do best. I researched. Stay tuned as we dive a little deeper. After compiling dozens of studies into 65 pages of written up research and spending hundreds of hours uncovering the roots of this debate, I realized something. The conversation around meat is missing a crucial piece. What the heck about our ancestors? What is the evolutionary component here? That's why I've created this video series, The Evolutionary Argument for Meat. It's not just about defending meat, but also taking a deep dive into the science, history, and ethics surrounding it. By revisiting the role of meat in human evolution, we can cut through the noise and move towards a more nuanced and informed discussion. Here's what this series will explore. The video will first tackle how human biology evolved with meat, from gut structure to brain development. Then, in the next video, I'll debunk the vegan health halo. Does veganism cost more to both humans and the environment alike than eating meat? Following that, I'll discuss the history of nutritional science. The shocking truth about how religious organizations and corporations have been manipulating research for decades to serve their own needs and goals. Then I want to talk to you about the moral landscape of eating meat, ethical considerations, humane practices, and the complexities of potential plant sentience. Back to today's video. We'll start where it all began. Evolution. Specifically, we'll explore how our biology, gut acidity, gut structure, and brain development reveals a surprising evolutionary truth. Humans weren't just capable of eating meat, we depended on it in ways that shaped who we are today. But what does that mean for how we should eat now? I'll go into the science behind nitrogen isotope studies, how these ancient chemical clues hidden in bones and fossils prove just how deeply intertwined animal-based foods are with our history, and why this evidence challenges some of today's popular dietary narratives. I'm gonna go into how our diets have shifted dramatically over the last 2,000 years. What caused this shift? And what did we lose in the process? And most importantly, what does it mean for our health, longevity, and even the future of our food systems? This is just the first step in a bigger journey to unpack the evolutionary, ethical, and scientific case for eating meat. And the goal of all this is to help you feel empowered so that you can make the right decisions to serve your personal health. Okay, let's dive in. This is the evolutionary argument for eating meat. Our biology, gut acidity, gut structure, and brain development reveals a surprising evolutionary truth. Humans may be omnivores, but our guts and brains scream for steak, not salad. Mm. Evolution didn't just make us capable of eating meat, it made us reliant on it in ways that shaped who we are today. From our stomachs to our brains, the story of our evolution is clear. Humans are built for meat. Let's break it down. Gut acidity. It's a huge clue to our ancestral diet. Our stomachs are a time capsule of our evolutionary past. One of the clearest indicators of a species diet is its stomach acidity. A 2015 analysis of birds and mammals found that more acidic stomachs are associated with carnivorous or scavenging diets, as high acidity protects against pathogens found in meat. And here's where it gets fascinating. Humans have the stomach acidity levels of carrion feeders, also known as scavengers, like vultures, which is far more acidic than our primate cousins. This gut acidity suggests that scavenging played a significant role in our evolutionary history, allowing us to access nutrient-rich animal foods. So think about it for a second. Let's say a saber-toothed tiger chases down and kills a gazelle. Then we, as humans, go with torches and with spears, and we shout and we yell and we have fire, and we drink drive the predator off of the prey that they just killed. That's been sitting in the sun for who knows how long. We go and we take some of the meat and we leave and we go back to safety. That's basically how it would have worked. And our guts reflect that. This extremely acidic gut is actually something that's pretty hard to maintain evolutionarily. And it suggests that for a very long time, humans needed this level of gut acidity so that we could consume meat just like vultures do, right? 
So that's the first signal that we are actually meant to eat meat. Now, the next important point is our gut structure. It is clearly evolved for meat digestion. When we compare our gut anatomy to that of our closest relatives, the great apes, a striking difference emerges. Humans have a smaller large intestine, which is where plant matter is fermented, and a larger small intestine, which is the primary site for meat digestion. The gut design isn't just a coincidence. It's a clear sign that meat, not just plants, has been on the menu for millions of years. Our smaller large intestine reflects less reliance on fibrous plant material, while our larger small intestine highlights our digestive system's efficiency at processing high quality animal proteins and fats. Now, here's something I always like to point out. The big brain that thought of veganism is dependent on millions of years of human meat eating. So here's how meat fueled our brain's evolution. Meat wasn't just a calorie source. It was a game changer for brain development. Nutrients like vitamin B3, abundant in meat, are critical for brain growth and function. A 2017 study suggests that access to meat and its nutrients helped fuel the development of our oversized brains, setting us apart from other primates. Without this evolutionary leap, our cognitive abilities and the very capacity to question our diets the way we do today would never have developed. Now, this is one of my favorite lines of evidence, the nitrogen isotopes. If our biology and biochemistry was not convincing enough, the isotopic analysis of ancient humans seals the deal. Studies of Neanderthals and early modern humans reveal high levels of nitrogen isotopes, which is a signature of a meat-rich diet. In fact, some early humans had nitrogen levels even higher than top predators, indicating a significant reliance on fish, aquatic animals, and shellfish alongside land-based meat sources. So the takeaway is, yes, humans are omnivores. We can survive on a variety of foods, but evolutionarily, we are primed for a diet rich in meat. This is the science behind nitrogen isotope studies. These are ancient chemical clues hidden in our bodies that prove how deeply intertwined animal-based foods are with our history and why this evidence challenges some of today's popular dietary narratives. Our ancient bones and tissue hold the key to uncovering what our ancestors truly ate, and the evidence is undeniable. Isotopic analysis reveals that humans have long relied on animal-based foods as a staple of their diet. These studies measure nitrogen isotopes, which act as chemical signatures left behind by the foods we eat. High levels of nitrogen isotopes are a hallmark of diets rich in meat and other animal products. We find consistently high nitrogen levels in Neanderthals and early modern humans. And these consistently high levels indicate that there was a very heavy reliance on meat in our past. In fact, some findings show levels even higher than apex predators, suggesting a diet not just rich in meat, but fish, aquatic animals, and shellfish. These findings challenge modern assumptions that humans have always subsisted on a predominantly plant-based diet. Instead, the research reveals that animal-based foods were not just an occasional addition, but a significant part of our dietary history. In fact, a fundamental part of it. This isotopic evidence is a powerful counter-argument to contemporary dietary trends that dismiss meat as unhealthy or unnecessary. Instead, it underscores how deeply animal-based products are intertwined with our evolutionary history, shaping not just our diets, but our biology, our brain structure, and our entire development as a species. Our diets have dramatically shifted over the last 2,000 years. But what caused this shift? And what did we lose in the process? And most importantly, what does it mean for our health, longevity, and even the future of our food systems. The story of our diets is one of dramatic change, driven by cultural, economic, and industrial forces that have steered us away from the evolutionary foundations of our biology. It's true, humans evolved as omnivores, but there's a strong preference for nutrient-dense animal-based foods. But over the last two millennia, this evolutionary heritage has been disrupted in significant ways. What caused this shift? Firstly, agriculture. Agricultural advancements and the rise of agriculture generally, particularly the cultivation of grains, marked a major turning point in human diets. Now, here are the core points. In the agricultural areas, the population skyrocketed, okay? Agriculture provides a steady source of food in the way hunting does not, and so the population boomed dramatically. But the people became shorter, more sickly, and in general, 
much less impressive specimens than the hunter-gatherers. This is a remarkable thing because this lasted for thousands of years, where in certain areas, for example, the Fertile Crescent, we had early agriculture and we can see how it impacted their jaws and their skeletons. And then you can look at the other groups, for example, throughout Northern Europe, who maintained their hunter-gatherer lifestyle and they were taller, more robust, etc. Now, here is a controversial and little known fact that's probably going to blow your mind. The light skin gene actually arises in the Fertile Crescent. The reason for it is that agriculture made it so there is much less dietary vitamin D than there is for the hunter-gatherers. There is vast evidence that in the Fertile Crescent, also known as the Middle East region, the light skin gene became necessary because there was so much less dietary vitamin D. Basically, animals typically have vitamin D stored in their fat. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. So when we ate a ton of meat and brain and marrow and all these things, we got a lot of dietary vitamin D. Now, suddenly, when we shifted over to agriculture, the population skyrockets, we're all sickly. But if you had darker skin, then you had less ability to synthesize vitamin D from the sun. Basically, there was a very strong evolutionary pressure. They would get rickets, which is the disease that happens when you don't get enough vitamin D. That's why we fortify milk with vitamin D in the modern age. So essentially the hunter-gatherers in Northern Europe and throughout Europe had darker skin than their agriculturalist cousins in the Middle East. So basically diet played a really remarkable and little known role in human history. While the genes did initially spread related to diet, sunlight also was of course involved. So while grain provided a reliable calorie source, it lacked the nutrient density of animal products that fueled our evolution. In the modern era, these dietary shifts have been heavily influenced by religious doctrines. For example, rules that restricted meat consumption and later ideologies like vegetarianism and veganism, which gained traction in the 19th and 20th centuries. With British colonialization of India, there was a backflow of ideas that were related to religion and vegetarianism. In the 1700s, we see this idea of vegetarianism is very tightly linked to religion throughout Europe as it spreads around. However, there was a series of doctors that were also intertwined with religion, whether it was the Christian scientists or later on the Seventh-day Adventists. These dietary ideas took on a sort of mystique of health. And that was a very important thing for our overall understanding of nutrition. I'll get into that more in detail in another video, but just understand that our current dietary guidelines are heavily impacted by belief systems and not actually by objective evidence. The industrialization of food production introduced refined carbohydrates, sugar, and processed foods into the human diet, leading to a significant departure from the nutrient-rich diets of our ancestors. But what did we actually lose in this process? Now, I keep saying this phrase, nutrient dense. Meat is a powerhouse of essential nutrients like vitamin B3, preformed vitamin A, which is called retinol, and many, many other ingredients, including cholesterol, that is critical for brain function. Meat and animal products are full of the most bioavailable proteins and fats and it is effectively impossible to replace them with plant-based alternatives. The shift to plant-heavy diets or processed foods has led to nutrient deficiencies and increased reliance on supplementation. As diets became less reliant on animal-based foods, the evolutionary alignment between our gut structure and our diet became weak. Our small intestine is optimized for meat digestion, but it was forced to process larger quantities of plant-based foods. This can lead to inefficiencies in nutrient absorption. So what does all this actually mean for your health and your future? Now, this is all really closely linked with the rise in chronic illnesses like obesity, diabetes, and malnutrition that we have seen in modern societies. This can be traced in large part to these dramatic dietary shifts. Ultra-processed foods and plant-heavy diets often fail to provide the full spectrum of nutrients needed for optimal health, forcing us to confront the limitations of moving too far away from our evolutionary diet. Modern diets also raise questions about sustainability and the balance between ethical food sourcing and meeting our biological needs. Luckily, there is a solution. Regenerative agriculture and sustainable meat production may hold the keys to reconciling these challenges with our evolutionary past. 
Regenerative meat farming in general has a net carbon sequestering effect. That's a great thing. The last 2000 years have taken us far from the nutrient dense diets of our ancestors. And this disconnection poses critical questions for the future of food systems, public health, and individual well-being. Understanding where we've come from is the first step to figuring out where we should go next. Humans may be omnivores, but our guts and brains scream for the fats and proteins in steak, not salad. From stomach acid strong enough to melt your keys, not quite, but to a gut optimized for high quality animal protein, our bodies are the result of millions of years of meat eating evolution.